My name is Andrew Hay. Uh, just briefly about me, and I'm going to apologize to the guy doing the camera because I'm just going to do this the whole time and avoid it. So I'm the COO at Lares. I've been in InfoSec for close to 25 years, uh, various roles and responsibilities. Lived and worked in Bermuda. I'm actually, I grew up in Ottawa. I'm from Halifax originally, but I grew up uh, here in Ottawa. Went to Lisgar just across the canal. Played rugby here for a number of unsuccessful years and uh, moved to the States because that's where all the money is. So one of the things that I do in my spare time is I coach rugby because I made the one mistake of bringing my wife with me to the doctor's office when uh, I had to have an x-ray of my back and to ask him, you know, how long was it going to be before I played rugby again? And his response was, oh, oh, you're not playing rugby ever again. I'm like, oh, probably shouldn't have brought my wife into the room for that diagnosis. So I've also written three books, four books that you've never read, but that's fine. And I blog very infrequently. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about in this session is, so I've been a CISO for a number of years. I've been a security executive at various different companies. Uh, different roles, responsibilities, and I've noticed that we as individuals, we tend to switch our view on how to instruct or teach someone something. So who here has young kids or has ever had young kids? Well, I can't pick on either of you two because you guys won't give me the good answers. Who, who says they have kids over here? You, sir. How old are your kids? All right. Has the four-year-old been involved in any sports at all, organized sports? All right. What about kicking a soccer ball back and forth? All right. So the first time you did that, I'm going to just make an assumption that they either missed it completely and fell on their back or got hit in the face based on every YouTube video I've ever seen started crying. Now there's probably, a, you know, that may or may not be correct, but for the sake of this conversation, let's say that that's exactly what happened, is one of those two things. There's two ways that you could have approached it. One, like most caring parents, which is why I couldn't call on you, is to nurture and encourage the kid that, oh, you know, this is how you do it, you should do this better, this is, you know, this is going to be a lot safer, you'll do it better next time. Or, like we treat student athletes, usually after they hit around 12, 14 years old, we come down on them and say, what are you doing? I told you how to do this right. Do it this way. You're being an idiot. And for some reason, in security and in IT and just management in general, we tend to lean more towards the latter when we're trying to communicate a security program or some sort of concept as opposed to the former, which might be a little different, uh, but might be a little bit more successful of a tactic. So that autocratic coaching, and if you've ever, this, oh, this presentation always works great in the US because uh, I always ask people, so I live in Texas, and I'm like, who here played high school football? And the entire room puts their hand up. And then I asked them, like, what would happen if you went to your coach and he, he, he would have questions for you, like, well, you know, how did I do at coaching? Was that a good session? Did you learn a lot from that? And they're all like, no, no coach of ours would ever say that because he would be too busy screaming at us for not doing the right thing. And that's kind of the way adult or young adult sports coaching and technology instruction happens. You know, this is the way you do something. You follow these steps and you get to the successful conclusion where you win. And that's not always the best method. So every player, and I'm going to use the term player and uh, professional, coworker, peer interchangeably, because it's really a lot of the same concepts. So if you want a good team, you want people to perform. And people are going to perform if they feel that they are important to that overall team. 
So this athlete center or athletic or athlete centric coaching style is something that's preached by the International Olympic Committee. And then that flows down to all of the different sporting organizations around the world. So I'm a certified, uh, what is it, USA Rugby Level 300, World Rugby Level 2 coach. So that means I can coach an international rugby team if they wanted me to. Uh, based on the last World Cup, they might want me to. I don't know. But uh, so I am qualified to instruct in a manner that follows the International Olympic Committee's model for encouraging people to compete. And that IOC coaching methodology seems to stop at a lot of the American sports because it still reverts back to the autocratic screaming, yelling, do what I told you to do, follow the playbook, everything will be fine. So there's, uh, there's a great coach who used to coach the New Zealand All Blacks. His name is Sir Graham Henry. And he was arguably one of the greatest coaches, especially following this athlete-centric coaching style. So if you ever watch rugby or soccer or any outside of North America type of coaching instructional venues, the coach is never on the sideline. They're usually sitting up in a booth. Because on game day, they know that their role was done on Tuesday or Thursday. They're there to let the team successfully execute the plan. You know, they may have microphones and talking to trainers and assistant coaches on the sidelines, but they're not there in the face yelling at the players to do what they're told because they trust the players that they have been instructed and they've learned the skills, developed the skills over the course of this period to actually execute on the game plan to get to their expected endpoint. So... Back to Sir Graham Henry. So he once said that better, better people make better all blacks. And that's the case in a lot of security programs and security organizations. You know, better leaders make better security individuals. And better security individuals make better security organizations. So it, becomes, it comes around full circle. So better trained people make better security decisions, make better team decisions to execute on a security strategy for the organization. So if I want you to take away anything from this session, it's to think differently. So you can go back to your office and is anyone here a CISO or a security leader in their organization or hope to be at some point? Careful what you wish for. Uh, Sometimes it's a really crappy job. But if you want to become a leader within the organization that you work for now or in the future, these are some tools to help you communicate either the objectives of the organization, the objectives of your skills, or at least just be a better person to help them be better people. So this is another tool for the tool belt. So there are two distinct coaching styles. There's the coach-centered and the player-centered. So you can use these interchangeably because different people require different ways of being coached. Has anyone ever been told that there are, been told that someone was a visual learner? Have you heard that before? Oh, I'm a visual learner, or I, you know, I can only learn if I'm sent to courses that cost four thousand dollars a week and and are out of the office. Well, that one's probably a little iffy, but the visual learner thing, that's a real thing. There's science behind that. Just like learning styles, there's different coaching styles. So the main difference, and I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, is that the coach-centric, it's drills. You're gonna do this, 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 this. And if you execute these plans correctly, you will get to a successful outcome. And this is only gonna work if you listen to what I am telling you to do. Don't deviate, don't be creative, just do what I'm telling you to do. Does anyone remember the old US Army slogan, the Army of One? That kind of backfired. 
because what they really meant was, uh, we're going to train you to be an effective soldier, but you're also going to have to work in a team. And we want you to be able to make those decisions on your own for the greater good of the entire team. So I remember in college, so I went to Algonquin College for a hot minute, and uh, I didn't do very well because, well, I went when I was 18, and, well, what's the drinking age in Hull? Around the same. Also, I lo I've looked like this since I was about 15, so the whole drinking age thing was never really an issue. But uh, all my friends would turn 18, and we would go over to Hull and drink and, and not go to class the next day. But one thing they taught you in class is how to be an individual and how to do all these things on your own. Go learn all of the skills to develop a program, to get your homework done, whatever it is. Then you get into the workforce, and what's the first thing you get thrown into? It's not a single person job, you're thrown into a team, and you have to work with other people that were also told or taught how to work as individuals. So that has since changed since I was in school, so there's a lot more team exercises and group work to get people to work together. Because let's be honest, most development is spent searching Google for the right answer and then taking that code and putting it back in the system. If that was around, I probably would have passed my classes a lot easier. I am very good at foosball though, so I will credit Algonquin for getting me very good at foosball. Uh, this autocratic coaching and coach centric is also very technique driven. So a good example is a spiral throwing a football. You know, there are certain ways, you know, don't throw the football fat end forward. It's not going to go very far. Throw it pointy end forward, spin it, follow through, and it will go farther and it will go straight. That is a technique. And you see, it's funny, in the, in the States, you actually see a, just in the backyards, you see these like nets with like the holes in it so that kids can learn how to properly throw a football and be the quarterback and be the star high school quarterback because that's, in Texas at least, that's every kid's dream or every parent's dream for their kid is to be the star quarterback. And you see them all over the place. That's not something you really see in Ottawa. You know, I, I grew up with a hockey net. Did my parents think I was gonna be a hockey star? I was not a thin kid or a very athletic kid, so they probably didn't think that. In fact, I probably would have been like the happy Gilmore, get caught taking my skate off to try and stab somebody with it, which is why I played rugby. So, you know, those are techniques that are just repetitive over and over and over again. And has anyone ever tried to teach their kids something that they're not really interested in? And do they lose interest? Let me tell you a story about my father. My father loved to go fishing. His idea of going fishing was getting up at like four in the morning, getting in a canoe, and then sitting there in silence for eight hours fishing. Uh, we would do this and I'd be 15. And what, do you, what does a 15 year old kid want to do more than sit in silence for eight hours at a time after getting up at four in the morning? The answer is absolutely anything but that. So I did not go fishing with my father. And he would try and teach me how to do fly fishing and I just couldn't be bothered because it was so stupid to me. He made it miserable for me. So I didn't want to keep doing it. So that technique driven method didn't really work for me. One thing that you'll learn about a lot of coach-centered coaching is that it's all about winning. Uh, people with young kids that are involved in sports, have they been involved in any sports that are, we don't give trophies or everyone gets a trophy kind of thing? How do you feel about that, sir, nodding your head? It's interesting. That's a very politically correct way to say it. I agree. It is interesting. I don't have kids. I have two dogs. So my statements may not matter. But I, you know, there is a time for winning. And there's a time to learn when to lose. And maybe that is later in life. So a lot of coaches and uh, 
athlete-centric coaches are showing kids how to play the game and how to enjoy the game as opposed to just trying to win the game. The old method is yelling at a, an eight-year-old till they burst into tears because they're too fat or they're not running fast enough. I was also not a very fast runner. Which brings me to the Navy. So I was in the Navy. Um, like I said, I've looked like this since I was 15. So when I was told to run and then run faster, those are two things that immediately I was no longer interested in being in the Navy. So boot camp was not for me. Three, I'm from Nova Scotia, so I'm not really that good at French. Where did I go to boot camp? Saint-Jean. Where were all my instructors from? Quebec. So I would be screamed at in French to run and run faster. Strike three, I'm out of there. I don't want to do this anymore. Not my thing, not my jam. So not the best method to motivate me. Could be because I'm an only child, I don't know. I'm spoiled. Eh. Uh, this coach-centric method is also very do what I say. I'm going to show you once, and then you're going to perfect it. I'm never going to have to show you again. Just look at the playbook. It shows you how to do it. No questions. Good. Do this. And then it's, again, you know, this is the way to do it. Don't deviate from it because I've, you know, I have years of experience as a parent of a four-year-old, so I know exactly how to coach this team. Well, that doesn't hold a lot of weight, but, you know, I've worked with people, and I, so not only do I coach adults, I've also taken ownership um, or I've been volunteered to coach the high school team, which means I not only have to coach high school students, but I have to now coach parents all at the same time. So it's a lot of juggling. And it's, you know, they're expecting me to come in and show their kids how to win, how to enjoy the game, how to balance their expectations, how to balance the kids' expectations. So I'm doing this huge juggling act. But they look to me as, okay, this guy has to know all the answers because he's now the head coach for the high school team. Surprise, I don't. So they will learn that very quickly. So it's going to be a learning process for all of us. Now, the player-centric, the International Olympic Committee has this concept. And if you've got young kids, you've probably seen this. It's the whole coaching through games. Because if you tell someone, hey, we're going to do a drill, they immediately think, crap, we're going to have to do a drill. If you say, we're going to play a game, like, oh, crap, I love games. Games are fun. Let's play games. So you're doing these games to reinforce the skills and the understanding over time. So you're making it fun and enjoyable. And you're making it a little competitive so that they're working with one another to get to an end goal, but also to beat another team. So I promise this starts to float into InfoSec very shortly with examples. Uh, Player-centric, athlete-centric, focused on the needs of the individual learner or a small group of learners. So if you think of, we go back to the individual that says, I'm a visual learner. If you give them nothing but books or a policy on how to, how the organization deals with phishing emails, do you think they're really gonna care? Probably not. If you gave them a scenario where they could click around and actually see things, might that be better for them to comprehend what's going on? Yes. Does that scale well across a large organization? No, but the trade-off is that you are tailoring the program for individual learners to reinforce that skill so that they don't have to keep running back to you every time they have a question on it. So it reinforces the learning for that individual based on their ability to absorb and recall knowledge. And you're helping really develop your players. So the IOC is all about not just getting people to become athletes to win at the Olympics. It's to help perpetuate the learning cycle. So you, Michael Phelps is a great example arguably the best swimmer in the Olympics ever. Um, 
I guarantee you his retirement plan was not, I'm going to retire and I'm going to do nothing but Subway commercials. This is going to be awesome. This is the pinnacle of my career. No. They're hoping that he is going to coach others on the U.S. swimming team how to be like him, whether that's from a direct coaching perspective or an advisor or helping get people in, excited about the sport and bring them in. Maybe he's just an ambassador, but it's perpetuating the need to develop that player and that individual to get other people involved. So you're developing a leader through following this systematic approach that can then be used down the road for the organization. In this case, the USA Swimming Committee. And it's also a very democratic way of teaching people and sharing learning. So one thing that we do a lot of is asking questions. So it's very hands-off, democratic. What do you think about this? What might be a better way to do that? What are the consequences of not executing XYZ. So you're having people answer questions and you might think, okay, well, there's always going to be a handful of people that just kind of stand back and let other people answer. I can tell you some ways to actually encourage other people to jump in if they're just wallflowers and don't really want to be involved. And that's where games come into play. And it's very informal. We want people to learn the basics, but also be creative. We want creative individuals that are going to learn how to secure the organization, how to perform in a sports environment or an athletic environment by setting the goal, giving them the tools to get to that goal. We don't care what happens in the middle, provided it's legal, they can draw on their skills and head towards that end goal because ultimately that's what we care about is the end goal and developing the players. So this coaching continuing, continuum, there's four phases to it. So what you do is you, and I'll, I'll use an example here in a moment. So you're setting up the scenario. You're going to instruct what's going to happen and explain what the outcomes are, what the objectives are. You're going to demonstrate so that visual learners can comprehend what's going on because, you know, we work with a lot of people where English is not their first language. They may not immediately resonate with the way that you're communicating. Some people that give presentations, English isn't their first language, so the way they're communicating doesn't, just doesn't mesh with the learner. Then the, the instructor or the coach is going to stand back, let them do the game, do the activity, and then help them along the way as needed for the individual learners to succeed. And then you go to the feedback phase. So it's not just getting feedback from them on the objectives, but also feedback about you as a coach. And I guarantee you, if you ask an employee before going through this continuing, has anyone ever asked for like a 360 review at work? Yes, you miss. Was it a glowing review? No? Was there a name on it? The anonymized reviews are generally, I'd say, more biting than the ones where, you know, if you have one employee and you ask for a 360 review, they're probably not going to come back and say, well, you're the worst boss ever, because you're going to know immediately that it's them. So that, that's probably not a very good career move on their part. If, so if you ask a group, how am I doing? Was that a good way to do this? unless you make it an open communication before you even get to that, and this process will build up, they will happily tell you how crappy you are and what you could do better. And it will be presented and received in a way and perceived by you as a way to make things better for the next group of people. So you'll see what I mean in a minute here. So when you are doing the instruction phase, make sure you always plan what you're going to say. So at halftime, I was notorious for walking out onto the field and we're either, and we're losing, let's say we're losing by like 10 points. And I would walk out on the field, I'd be all flustered, I'd be like, well, that wasn't very good. Um, let's, let's do better next half. You know, let's, 
all those things that we sucked at in the first half, we shouldn't do that. We should do that better. That's not how we learned. All right, so go. Go do better. And everyone's like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> like, that, that's not going to help me learn. Like, what, what did I do wrong? Like, apparently everything. So it's not a very good way to communicate what needs to improve and what was, you know, what could be tweaked or nudged. So always plan what you're going to say before you speak because, or plan what you're going to say before you speak because you, if you exude confidence, people are going to receive that as, oh, this person knows what they're talking about and I will listen to this person. Make sure you always gain the attention of the person before, or the people before you start. Especially in this age of mobile devices, you don't want to keep re-explaining yourself. So get everyone's attention. And then keep it nice, short, bite-sized, chunk-type messages. Just sound bites. Think of it as sound bites. Everything they need to do to perform the task. And that's it. No more. The more flowery language you put on it, the more difficult it is going to be to move on to the next phase. Because you'll start going down a path, you'll say, oh, I've got a story about that, and blah, 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 and you'll never get on to the, they'll lose the, the short things that you told them at the beginning. And then make sure you always ask questions. And this is, the, this is opening the door to getting them comfortable around you and around their peers to actually ask some questions that they may not understand. So here's an example. All right, so we're gonna do a fishing scenario. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to get their attention. I've got my notes on what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to ask questions, make sure everyone understands what we're going to talk about for this fishing scenario. Gain their attention. Okay, hey everyone, uh, can everyone hear me? That's a great way to open it up. Can everyone hear me? Because usually that's when people look up from their phones like, oh crap, I can't hear them. So we're going to get started on this fishing email identification group exercise. It's going to be really fun. And we're all going to get involved here. Short message. So I want everyone to take a look at three emails and discuss with your partner if they look legitimate or more like phishing emails. So I'm going to give you two minutes per email to discuss with your teammate. And then whichever team has the best analysis is declared the winner. So that's a short message. Okay? Three emails. Work with your teammate to find what's wrong and document it. Present your findings at the end, and you're going to be a winner if you do it the best. Note, I've not told them what they're going to win. It's just that they're going to be a winner. And everyone likes to be told that they are a winner. Even if there's nothing at the other end of that rainbow, no pot of gold, they just know, well, shit, I want to be a winner. I want to beat my other, these other teams in here. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to work hard to win because I want to be a winner. Like I said, I'm an only child, and that's very important to me. I want to be a winner all the time. So number four, just clarify. So we're doing three emails, two minutes each. Discuss the features with your partner. Does that make sense for everyone? Does anyone have any questions? That is a great way to finish trying to get clarification. Does that make sense? Because if it doesn't make sense, someone will put their hand up and ask. And if no one answers, like, okay, does anyone have any questions before we move on? You're giving them two opportunities to put their hand up and ask a question. So the reason we ask questions is to check for knowledge, to check for comprehension, and to check to make sure they know how they're applying that knowledge to a game situation, in this case, the fishing exercise, the fishing training exercise. And the players or professionals use that information to analyze themselves, okay, well, this is what they're asking of me. I'm pretty sure I've got this understood. Synthesizing it so that they can, it's okay, well, he said this. I think he means this. Yeah, he definitely means this, so I, I know what I can do. And then evaluate, okay, well, I know that if I get the top, if, I, if me and my teammate here get all the best answers, we're going to win, and winning's important, and we'll be winners. I'm still not sure what I'm going to win, but I'm going to be a winner, and I like that so far. So now, before you get started, you could easily just say, all right, we're going to do this now. Jump into it. Do your thing. But there's the odd chance that someone may not understand. So that's when you do just a short demonstration. So make sure that you can position yourself so everyone can hear you, you know, front of the room. 
Just focus on one or two points in your demo. If you need to, repeat it again, if you see some blank faces around the room. And then, again, ask questions or invite those questions and check to make sure everyone understands. So this is like their, all right, you know what? We're gonna go on this road trip. If anyone has to pee, do it now. I'm not turning the car around. I mean it this time. This is like the last chance. Obviously, you're not demonstrating how to pee. That's, maybe that's the worst analogy I could have used, but you get what I'm going for here. So, I heard two gentlemen over here talking about rugby earlier. Is it you, sir? Maybe? You're talking about Sonny Bill Williams? All right. So I, I, I presume that you know rugby, <laughs> not just the guy's name. Have you played before? All right. So can you instruct me how to perform a sidestep? No. So yeah, it, so essentially what you're asking, you can tell someone how to do a sidestep. Just do a sidestep. And they're like, okay, so I just do this instead of running forward? Well, there's more to it. So a sidestep is really, hey, you're running fast at someone full tilt, and you have to change directions so that you avoid the tackle. And it sounds kind of simple when you say it like that, but there's a lot involved. There's a lot of mechanics involved, especially if you've taken kinesiology or kinematics and dynamics, you know that there's a lot of muscles and ligaments and tendons involved in something as simple as changing direction while running. So these are the textbook answers. So you target the nearest defender, you're running with the ball, change direction as close as possible, because if I change direction far away, they're gonna know where I'm going and they're gonna go that way too. So change direction close to the ball. You're going to plant your foot and then spring off of that foot with maximum effort to change directions and then accelerate in the other direction. If you do it too close, you're going to run into them. If you do it too far back, they're going to know where you're going. So you have to find that sweet spot of knowing when to cut and bypass them. So let's do another thing here. Kelman, my man, I would like you to instruct me how to drink from that water bottle. But the caveat is, I am blind. See, there's a lot of things involved in teaching someone a seemingly simple skill, like you saying, you know, put your arm out. All right, well, my arm's out. Move it down more, okay. Move it to the right, all right. Like, so we went through this the last time I gave this presentation and it got to the situation where the guy's like, okay, well, put your, you're standing right in front of it, okay, so I know where I am. Put your hand at a 45 degree downward angle, okay. Move slightly to the right, okay. I went, okay, now go slightly to the left, like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I found it. Okay, now grasp it. Bend your elbow towards your mouth. Use your other hand to twist the cap in a counterclockwise position. And then when you are ready, open your mouth and lift the bottle towards your lips. Not at a horrible angle, because you may pour the water all over yourself, but just gently bring it towards your lips, and then you should have an easy way to drink water. Like That's a lot of instruction for something as simple as drink a bottle of water. And some people require that level of instruction. So that's the need of the individual learner. So just like a sidestep is more than walk to the side, it's difficult. And it takes a lot of energy to teach someone something new. But I guarantee you now, if you go back to your office and you do this same exercise of the show me how to drink water, pretend I'm blind, you'll probably be able to instruct those people after they fail miserably the first time, some of the cues to actually coach them to instruct someone in the future. 
Or if you don't like them, you'll get them to pour the water all over themselves. Either way, it'll be fun for everybody. So, actually one thing about positioning so everyone can see in here. If you're standing on outdoors in a sports field and you're addressing a team, where should you stand relative to where the sun is? Right, so I'm facing the sun, why? So they can see me, because you don't want them squinting and you want them to be able to see your expressions, ask any questions. You don't want them getting bored and looking away because their eyes hurt because of the sun. You know, they don't teach that in, the, in rugby coaching until the level 300. So after you've already coached people for five years, only then do they say, hey, you know what? Don't stand with the sun at your back. And now, whenever I'm coaching, I'm like, all right, where the hell's the sun? Okay, so it's over there. So, yeah, can everyone, can, no, everyone stand here. You, have, you can't stand with the sun behind me. So it's just one of those things. So in this case, we're standing at the front of the room so everyone can see the screen, projector, whatever. We're going to focus on two, one to two key points. So before we get started, we're going to take a look at a sample email. So I'm going to bring it up on the screen. Note the suspicious email address when I hover over the sender's name. So that's one thing. And then also note the sender is asking me to send strangely sensitive information that they've never really asked for in the past. So those are two things you might want to note. Then repeat it if you have to. All right, sample email number two. It's an expected email address when we hover over it with the mouse. The email is also asking for information that this person always asks for. So it's not that strange. So this could be a legitimate email. So you should note that as well. And then you ask them, you know, these are a couple of examples. There are going to be more things that you are likely going to find in your analysis. Does anyone have any questions? So that's that final asking for input. And because you've gone through this a couple times and asked questions, by this point, you will get far more people, if they don't understand or have further questions, they will ask. I don't know what it is, There's, there has to be some science behind it, but if you give people enough opportunities to actually ask a question and show that it's, it's an inclusive environment and then everyone's on the same team and trying to learn, if they don't understand, they're probably gonna put their hand up. Like I said, there's gotta be some science behind it. I don't know what it is, but in my anecdotal experience, run into it all the time. So then you're doing the, the observe, observe and report. So you're gonna focus on the key factors key factor of this case being, okay, well, they, they should probably mouse over the email address, we should look for content, we should maybe look at headers, any other information that might be suspicious in these emails. And then walk around the room. Don't just stand at the front of the room, because if someone is not understanding, you can just go and help that individual. Just nudge them towards the right answer. Or ask them, you know, what were we doing when we were mousing over? Oh, we were seeing if the email was, was legitimate or not. Okay, well, does this email look legitimate? No, it doesn't. Like, okay, well, there's one thing. If you have any other questions, let me know. And then continue walking around the room. And then when everyone's done, you can get everyone to present their findings. And really, you're, you're helping them determine further actions in the future. So, if there was something that was wrong in your training plan or the way that you communicated how things were, should have shaken out at the end, this is when they can come back to you and say, well, yeah, this didn't really work when we did this. Why was that? And you have a chance to actually help nudge or help correct it around bleh, along the end way. So there's two types of ways to ask for feedback. There's the push and the pull model. For any of you that have teenagers, you ask, hey, what'd you learn at school today? What's the answer? Nothing. Surely you couldn't have learned nothing. You had to learn something. Nope, nothing. So that's, you're really trying to just pull information out of them with these clarifying questions. And that's a legitimate way to do it. Um, if you've ever given or received feedback 
for performance evaluation, what do they tell you? Uh, state one positive, state a negative, but then you, know, you want to sandwich that with another positive so you don't sound like a jerk. So you have that nasty one in the middle and then two good ones on the outside. Well, that's, you know, you're, you're kind of pushing for feedback there. It's like, okay, you did this really well, you did this well, but you kind of screwed up over here, or you need to do that better the next time. And what this example doesn't show you is that anchoring business school thing of, oh yeah, you did this really well too, you know, high five. Let's keep on being friends, let's be work friends. The pull method is really, okay, well, what worked? What went well? So at the end of that scenario, you could ask them, hey, what did you guys learn or what did you guys do that would help you recognize things like this in your job? You know, can you, can you now identify phishing emails? And what are some of the things that you can look for? And they're like, oh yeah, we do this, 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 and this. Okay, well, what didn't work? You know, what are some of the things that you expected to happen that didn't really happen? Oh, well, you know, I moused over the email and I, you know, there was no pop-up or anything, so I, I didn't really know if that was legit or not. I'm like, okay, that's fair. So what would you do next time? Okay, well, I could forward the email and that would show me the email address. I could look at the headers, I could blah, blah, blah. And everyone's kind of contributing at that point. And you've got everyone in a group and you're helping people answer each other in a more democratic way. So everyone's helping each other. We're getting stronger as a team as opposed to just individual athletes or performers. And that doesn't stop at the coach either because that's when you say, okay, well, what did I do well in communicating this scenario? Was I clear? Did this, you know, what, could I have done something better? You know, what didn't I do well? Help me learn so that next time for the next group, I can communicate this better because I want to make sure that the next group doesn't have some of these questions that you ran into. So what could I do better as a coach, as a security manager, as the CISO to communicate why phishing is important and the ways to spot phishing? So it, it may seem like a very arduous task, but it's another way to help people understand things. And you know, we've already talked about over and over again how you know, not everyone learns the same way. So my wife is an instructional designer who left tech, uh, had her midlife crisis and became a personal trainer. And which means that I can never have a midlife crisis because we can't afford it now that she's had one. But she, you know, she's learned, she's taken her knowledge of training adults and taken it to helping people get more physically fit. So she knows some of the key things to hone in on for people that work in IT and just tech in general because they have office jobs. So she knows how to you know, pull some of those strings to help them relate to one another. And it's, it's just one method of coaching. So she knows you know, questions to ask that only appear in that type of scenario would be able to answer or even ask in the first place and understand. So one thing I, I strongly believe in is that security, just like coaching, is not about you. It's about the team. You know, Bill Belichick might be a great coach, but uh, he alone cannot win a Super Bowl. He may believe that, but uh, you know, he builds a team around the organization to win Super Bowls. You can't just have individuals. And if you use these player-centered coaching techniques in the workplace, you will grow understanding. You will reach people that you were unable to reach before that may have just tuned out because you're tailoring it for them. So if anything, it'll help you get better as a security leader within the organization. And with that, the red light's on. Uh, these are a couple references, strongly recommend. And uh, that's how to get a hold of me. Mm -hmm.